Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Francesco Scartosi. I'm the Director of Sales of the Americas. I'm joined here by my uh, colleague Daniel Maloney, Technical Marketing Manager. We'd like to welcome you and thank you for attending this afternoon. We're glad to see so many of you joining us here this afternoon. And uh, before we begin, I'd like to take care of some housekeeping. Uh, please note that you have a Q&A box in which you can enter any and all questions. We encourage you to type in your questions as they come to you throughout the presentation. And we promise we'll get to them at the very end of the presentation. So um, what we'll be doing today is giving those of you who haven't had a chance to join us at NAB at the launch of the Monarch HDX, a deep dive into this technology. We want to do this in a way that becomes clear to you just how you can use it in your specific workflow. So Dan has also prepared a demo of the HDX that will give you a good overview of how the Monarch HDX can be used. So uh, stick around, it's going to be a fun ride and uh, the webinar is rated PG which means participation guaranteed. You'll see what I mean as we get into it. So let's begin. When we uh, were deciding to do this webinar, we wanted to do this in a way um, that best introduces the technology uh, to give you a sneak peek as to how and why we created this technology. It really boils down to two main attributes that we observed that we all share. These attributes are the need to communicate messages that are important to us and the need to record and preserve these messages. I mean, throughout our history, there's clear evidence that the underlining behavior of how we connect and how we communicate really hasn't changed. I mean, in the past, people tended to gather together in groups, listen to a message together, and one that was relevant and important to that group. When that message was transmitted, the people would essentially walk away and the speaker would turn off. Even though today we've evolved quite a bit and technology is really never off, we still gather to hear messages, uh, witness events that are relevant and important to us specifically. I mean, look at what we're doing here today at the webinar, right? Well, at Matrox, we studied this fundamental trait and we believe that if we can make it easier for people to connect, communicate, we could be a big part of how the people evolve the communication, um, especially of those messages that are important to their respective audiences. The second trait that we noticed was the trait that we as a society all share, no matter what culture we belong to, as the need to record and preserve events are extremely important to us, whether they be a story of a great hunt, a religious ceremony, or a little league game. We recorded all these events because these events were important to us. The need to preserve them is strong. The need to ensure that these events can be recorded, to be remembered and passed on is what's really important. So where does Matrox come into it? Well, as a technology provider, we wanted to create a tool that highlights these two important behaviors that we as humans, as humans all share and will continue to exhibit. So today, Dan and I will be diving into the technology Matrox has engineered to help us communicate and record our messages throughout various workflows. Whether you belong to a university looking for a lecture capture system or a house of worship looking for a way to reach your congregation, no matter where they are in the world, or in fact a broadcaster looking to reach new audiences. This is what we, we wanted to, uh, to, to accomplish here today. But one thing that we uh, need to be mindful of is that in all these cases, streaming is the new way to communicate. I mean, streaming has really evolved, especially with the advent of the iPad. The iPad basically uh, introduced some a phenomenon in our culture that we haven't really seen before. Before the iPad, streaming was a cool technology, but once the iPad showed up, there was, you know, a over 300 million unique views of live video consumed by the web uh, on a monthly basis. And um, there's no real surprise why that is. It's because you can access what you want. Essentially, whether it's a, 
a political rally, sporting event, or a concert, and you could ac access that when you want it, whether it be live or on demand. So we take a look at that here at Matrox, and it fundamentally it strikes pretty much close to what we, we, uh, we believe. And we believe we needed to create a tool that has a perfect balance between a communication tool and a recording tool. In fact, we believe that anything worth streaming is worth recording. So let's continue here. Um, in fact, our, our first, you know, in September this year, it'll be two years since we came out on the market with uh, the first incarnation of a product that, that embraced our belief that anything worth streaming is worth recording. That was the Monarch HD. And the Monarch HD, effectively, right out of the gate, really resonated in some uh, key areas, key workflows, whether it be in education, like I said, Houses of Worship, or PEG, which, um, which fundamentally is uh, public uh, access ed education and government uh, television. Um, and there was, if you look at the workflows, there's, there's really no surprise in why that is. I mean, look at the new classroom. The new classroom is really not constrained by the uh, students that can physically be there. In fact, many of the classrooms today are equipped with video equipment to capture the lecture uh, right there in the classroom so that they can transmit it to a remote student. How we do that, as I alluded to in the in previous uh, slides, we harness the power of the web. But not only that, the new classroom has the need to um, store locally the material that, or the lectures, for example, that uh, are being transmitted, right? So that the students could then learn at their own pace. Moreover, the professor would want uh, to equip or use the tools that are in the classroom. And what you see here is a Crestron control surface. This is an example of um, what they are used to controlling. So controlling the lights, the projector, and in this case, a tool that could be used to stream and record. So being able to fill that hole with a unit that can embrace and tie all of this together so that you can get to your remote students would be ideal. Now going one step further and looking at the new way to worship, we see that in, in many cases, the, um, especially in the megachurches, um, you know, where there's a thousand plus people who participate on a weekly basis, um, having video cameras, video switchers are um, a staple and, and pretty common to see in those workflows um, so that you can again harness the power of the web using the CDNs, uh, content distribution networks, that are designed to get uh, the worship uh, message across, whether it be any of these partners or any others, really, to get to your congregation no matter where they are in the world. Again, being able to record that locally so you can post that up on the, um, the website um, and having a unit that can really tie all of these pieces together. That was, you know, um, a workflow that we wanted to be very mindful of. Now, going further and evolving our product line with the Monarch HDX, we realized that broadcasters were also having similar needs. They have similar workflow, um, you know, ver very similar to any live production, really. And however, the question they're trying to answer is how do I go from on air to online? And in order to answer that question, we really had to look into the workflow. And as even though I do highlight here the how they broadcast online, how they get to that answer, you'll see that this workflow is very common to no matter what um, environment you are integrating. So it starts off quite simply with live live sources. In this case, in the studio, will be studio cameras. Uh, other sources could be scan converters that take uh, computer-based content, whether it be Google Earth, Skype, or what have you, and turn them into HDSDI signals uh, to, to be used within the production feed. Character generators that add rich graphics to your live feed, and uh, video playout servers that add the ability to play out clips. All of those sources being able to feed that into a switcher and transmit that on, on air has, has been mastered. In fact, 
a lot of broadcasters and a lot of people that are putting together workflows today have been mastering this uh, not only um, you know uh, for baseband transmission but in HD as well now the question is how do I get the different audiences how do I get all those eyeballs the ones that are trans transitioning to a um, mobile device well I ideally and what we saw was the need for a piece of equipment at the end of this chain that respects the fact that you've actually just invested all of the equipment to be able to produce a high quality HD production and if you could fill that hole with a unit that can allow you to go and feed your traditional audience as well as the audience that is now found online that is the key and that's what we saw and that was you know really sparked us to evolve the Monarch product family um, to, to really harness what we call the three R's and the three R's, what we mean by the three R's are three fundamental principles that we wanted to engineer into the next evolution of the Monarch family. And that would be reliability, redundancy, and robustness. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. So we'll start from reliability. Reliability, first off, comes from the very basic signal input. If your video signal is as clean as the one you see on screen, we have no problem. I mean, it gets digitized, it gets fed to encoders, perfect. There is no surprises. Reality is, most signals don't come in that clean. There are disruptions. In fact, if you're not dealing with them properly, there are very um, you know, unwanted errors that occur. And these errors um, or disruptions really come from various feeds whether it be a satellite source that is needs to be used within your production or an analog uh, device that is just uh, feeding you an unclean signal what we need to do is provide as 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 developers of technology is provide you a way to deal with these uh, situations because no matter what they will exist and the way to do that I'll show you what what it means um, if you're not equipped to deal with these uh, anomalies, especially from a perspective of an encoder. So here you are watching on your uh, iPad your favorite hockey team playing uh, an NHL game. The signal comes in and they're feeding the encoder is an unclean signal and you have no way of dealing with that. What you see is in fact anomalies in the encoder and the worst case scenario it puts the encoder in a state where it can't continue doing its job. What we, what we need to fold into this solution are frame synchronizers. What a frame synchronizer does fundamentally is allow you to bring in the video signal even with the um, errors, inherent errors that are, are um, coming from various pieces of equipment. And if the frame synchronizer is part of the first part of the chain of the video processing, you'll see that as it cleans up the signal, it buffers the encoder from all of these disruptions. In fact, allowing it to continue doing its job and doing it well. So the second of the th three R's is redundancy. And this one actually means quite a lot. So first off, in terms of redundancy, is what happens when catastrophic errors occur. I mean, the most catastrophic error is power outage. We, we basically lose power to the unit. The unit has a, a catastrophic failure. Well, running to the exits, no matter where and what environment you're in, is not an option. You need to deal with that. And we have to build in technology into it, this encoder that allows you to deal with it. So here you are with a, uh, a video encoder that takes in a video source, sends it to do a, a primary, a specific task. In this case, it will encode the video. Well, that link between the source and the primary task is vital. If it gets severed, what we want it to do is allow you to continue to pass that video source right through. Sure, in this case, you'll lose the primary specific task, but having the um, redundancy built in, allowing that video source to pass right through, allows you to feed it to a secondary encoder, allows you to uh, feed it within your production so it can continue being 
uh, fed or, or used as a source. So that's what we mean by internal redundancy. Um, redundancy, the second R, also comes in when we were designing the streaming capability. So here you are sending a video signal out as your primary stream and you have congestion, network congestion. Your feed, your, your message cannot be transmitted uh, through that lane uh, because of congestion or worst case scenario your, your server goes down. Having built in redundancy, a way to go around that, a secondary path so you can continue sending that message becomes a, a feature that we m needed to fit into our next generation Monarch product. Redundancy as it comes into recording is also important. So if you're going to be using this unit to want to record as well, well looking at it, you, you have an ability to bring in live video, record that, say I choose to send that to a network map drive and off we're off recording, everything's perfect and the network connection is severed. That network map drive is no longer available to me. Having a redundant path that I could send my video sources to continue to be encoded locally is a key feature that many of you out there were asking for. Lastly, the third of our three R's, robustness. And this is comes into effect when we look at the flexibility of the I.O. Many of, many of you are building environments that need to deal with various sources, whether they're HDMI or SDI, whether they be SD, HD, or 3G. Having uh, an encoding unit that can deal with all of these signals without a converter uh, becomes important, and we wanted to, to, to give you that option. So at NAB this year, we launched uh, the new member to our Monarch family, the Monarch HDX, which is in fact a dual channel H.264 encoder for broadcast streaming and recording. So I'm going to pass it off to Dan and he's going to take you through uh, how the Monarch HDX came about and more importantly what makes it tick. Dan? Thanks Frank. Um, so we introduced uh, the Monarch HD, or Frank introduced uh, Monarch HD, and some of the um, important design considerations that went to Monarch HDX. In fact, the HDX is basically a superset of the Monarch HD. So I thought I'd go through a comparison of the uh, of what the two products can do uh, to be able to introduce um, the whole plat the platforms effectively. So maybe we we'll start talking about its key feature, which is an encoding capacity, the ability to encode H.264. So what are the um, how, how do we harness this uh, this impressive codec? And, and um, uh, the first thing we can note is that um, the Monarch HD had two encoders that were specifically tasked: one for streaming, one for recording. The Monarch HD opens this up, opens up more flexibility. Uh, it's more powerful, more flexible. Engine allows uh, the two encoders to be tasked for either streaming, and recording, like the Monarch HD, or dual streaming or dual recording. Um, situations. Now, if you want to harness all the encoding capacity and focus it onto a single encoding task, um, you can do those, that with both products. And here are the maximum, or the, the, the capacities of the, these, uh, these devices. You can stream at up to 20 megabits per second. And that's for both platforms. In recording, you can record it up to 30 megabits per second. So that's the, at the bit rate level. And at the resolution level, the Monarch HDX allows accepts either HDMI or SDI signals up to 1080p60, and they can be encoded at those resolutions at up to 1080p60. Whereas the Monarch HD limits um, the, uh, the the input resolution, or excuse me, limits the encoding resolution to either 1080p30 or 720p60. I'd like to note that at the input. Uh, Inputs up to 1080p60 are accepted, and what I'm talking about now are the encoding resolutions, the differences. Now, the, both devices can put in dual encode mode. They want to use both encoders for um, uh, for a variety of tasks. Um, Monarch, so in both cases, Monarch HD and HDX both have a maximum stream capacity of 10 megabits per second, 
per encoder when streaming. If you're, and the combined total for both encoders, no matter what mode they're setting, they're, they're, they're in, whether recording or streaming, the maximum combined is 30 megabits per second. So Monarch HD is streaming and recording, but Monarch HDX allows you to do a couple of things. So depending on how each co encoder is set up, I'll give you a couple of examples. In dual record mode, you might opt to use one encodec at full resolution recording at 25 megabits per second, with the second codec um, encoder set to a lower resolution, lower bit rate, a proxy resolution. You may opt to have both encoders running at 15 megabits per second, possibly targeting two different uh, destinations for those recorded files. If you opt to have one streaming at say 5 megabits per second, your second encoder could be streaming at 15 or go all the way up to 25, 25 megabits per second. Should you want to maximize your stream, you're looking at 10 megabits per second for stream uh, 2, while stream or encoder 1 could be recording at 20. Finally, if both are set for streaming, well, you can dial either up all the way up to 10 megabits per second. Now, at a resolution standpoint, Monarch HDX allows full flexibility at the input level, uh, or excuse me, at the encoding level for both encoders. Both can encode up to 1080p30. The Monarch HD, the first encoder could be set to 1080p30, while the second one could be set to 720p30 maximum. And that doesn't matter whether which resolution was dedicated to which um, encoding uh, type, recording or streaming. So what new workflows does the Monarch HDX offer us? Something that the Monarch HD, um, uh, in addition to what the Monarch HD can do. Well, as a pure recorder, um, one of the markets that, uh, are particularly in broadcast, that could use the device is the ability to archive um, the content that they're broadcasting, having a record of what was sent on air. An H.264 codec, which is what the Monarch records to, is ideal for that task. So say you have a, a typical broadcast router in your broadcast plant, you would take one of those SDI feeds and send that, uh, of what's going on air, and send that to the Monarch HDX. In turn, you would maybe send a task, the Monarch HDX, to record to a network Mac drive, something that Frank alluded to earlier, while so and that network map drive could be accessed by anybody on the um, on the local network, um, making it very convenient to to access the material um, from anywhere within the the network. However, in the event and while you're sending that to the centralized media library, you may want to or you would want to record that same content at the same bit rate. Uh, locally to USB or in this case I'm illustrating an SD card. In the event the network is lost, the SD card would still preserve that recording and it could be uploaded at a later date. Networks are fallible. Having this redundancy um, is a powerful feature. On the streaming side, you may want to take that same SDI feed and say target your primary streaming server, something that your, the, the majority of viewers would actually uh, be accessing to view a live stream. But it, you, with a second encoder available for streaming, you may want to stream that to a, the second stream to a backup server. You would maybe set the same bit rate, say 3 megabit per second for a 720p 30 stream to primary and secondary server, and that's available or accessible via the web your audience would be logging to the primary server, but in the event that the network uh, or the primary server were to go down, um, you could have that same audience log into a backup server and still get access to that live event. The same monarch could be used, can use the two streams for a different task to actually target two different bit rates, so two types of audience members. One that would consume their media at a high bit rate, such as a home viewer, um, somebody who's got a ne wired network connection or a Wi-Fi connection, but those that want to view on their um, uh, 3G or LTE or 4G network uh, may prefer to receive that at a much lower bit rate. So home viewers may log in at 5 megabits per second, whereas um, a mobile users may prefer a 1 megabit per second stream. This, max, this single device, Monarch HD, allows you to reach the maximum audience. So, Monarch HD, how many encoding engines does it have? Two. One task for streaming, 
One task for recording. Monarch HDX. How many encoded engines does it have? Three. You want ask three. I didn't introduce three. Well, let me uh, be clear. The first two encoders are the primary encoders that could be either tasked to streaming or recording. And there's a third encoder. And this encoder is a input preview encoder. And this is encoder is only available on the Monarch HDX. And this is a, an important feature uh, that allows users, again, more flexibility in um, setting up and uh, ensuring their, their production would go very smoothly. So if I took a look at how we would use the three encoders, the first encoder is what you would use to view the live input coming into the Monarch without activating the two primary encoders. So as you're just reviewing what's happening, if you're behind the scenes at an event, uh, you want to see what's being fed your encoder, you activate or view the, uh, the preview encoder and you can see that the action is not yet ready to go. But once it is, you can then um, activate your primary encoders, whether it be set for streaming or recording, and then ensure that once the action starts, you haven't missed any of the uh, any of that material. So, how you make this get access to this input preview encoder is a number of ways. One is directly embedded in our uh, control panel, control panel of our Monarch. The Monarch HD and HDX are web-based appliances. You control uh, them, set them up via a web page. Any web page using any computer on the same network as the Monarch would be used to control the device, can be used to control the device. And there, in that status page, you would find um, the input preview. You could also log into the Monarch and access that via third-party devices like Crestron or uh, even software such as VLC or QuickTime. It's a standard RTSP stream, this uh, input preview encoder stream. So I've introduced the concept of the web page or the command center. Maybe it's a good time for the demo, and uh, we'll bring up that web page right now. So what we have on my screen now is I'm still sharing the same computer where my the, the keynote was happening. Uh, on my um, uh, main page, I have the status page of the Monarch HDX. That, uh, at an IP address that you see in the, um, the, the browser bar. What we can see here is the settings, the, the settings of encoder 1 and encoder 2, as well as a video input. What's uh, the status of our video input, the type of resolution, and where my audio is coming from. Uh, at the bottom you have a message center, so if uh, warnings come up or errors, they could come up in this section. What I have here is a show preview button and we will go ahead and see what's being fed the Monarch at this time. Press that. And what's getting launched now is an embedded QuickTime player. It will log up, and there we are. What you're seeing now is Frank and I live in a small embedded window. But I don't want to spoil the surprise. I'll let you guys see it uh, as a primary stream in a moment. I'll first go to the encoder settings to see how I'm setting up the device. I have two encoders, one set up for RTMP streaming. So I'll be streaming to a uh, media server, in this case, Wowza Streaming Engine. It is in turn feeding out web page um, the live stream that we're going to log into in a moment. My bit rate is 2.4 uh, megabits per second and a resolution of 720p 30 frame per second. Encoder 2 is actually set for recording and I'm recording at full resolution 1920 1080 again at 30 frames per second but my bit rate is much higher but 25 megabits per second uh, and I'll be targeting a network or a media drive in fact what you see on the right hand side of my screen is uh, just the um, the brow or excuse me the uh, uh, the tool where uh, the Explorer tool um, that will allow us to see where the files are being recorded on the desktop so I'm going to go ahead and activate the two streams, both the stream and the recording. And I can see that both of them have begun. And I can actually immediately see on the side here, I've created a new file that's recording to a new MOV file that includes a time and date at which it was recorded. Another thing I'd like to point out in the recording side is um, this concept of um, file segmentation or file switching. Um, right now I've got it set to uh, just record indefinitely. However, I could go ahead and 
put switch points in my files so during a long recording session I could automatically segment those file that that recording in say 10 5 10 50 one hour chunks um, without missing a single frame between at the switch points and uh, that a lot of usefulness in that first uh, useful tool first reason why that's useful is in the event there's a problem with the with the file writing with your drive the files that have been recorded and closed out uh, will not be lost only the active segment being written would be uh, potentially lost also uh, if you want to start getting VOD uh, clips of the a long event up online uh, quickly and in high quality you can do a quick edit on some of the early uh, earlier content make those available all the while still streaming the live event a couple of ways that that file segmentation tool is useful so we're gonna go ahead and take a look at the while this is recording and streaming I'm just going to launch uh, the browser in which our uh, monarch is targeting so first things first this is we're using a tool called WebEx to do this uh, the stream it is not a uh, optimized for live streaming oh let me first press play that would help you can see it uh, updating so there we are it was about a four second delay between my voice which is what being provided by WebEx and the actual live stream which Wowza is uh, is sending out um, again this is for demonstration purposes uh, wanted to show how the Monarch HD is being used in a live event is not bi-directional you wouldn't be communicating with all the other tools that WebEx is providing us and um, you would be logging in directly to my web server so uh, I can go there full screen this is again 720p 30 uh, how do you guys like our stage here we tried to uh, tried to make uh, something as professional as possible uh, far be it from us from being radio or, or television hosts but uh, we Speak tried our best <laughs> uh, so that's I can uh, now go back to our uh, go ahead back to our web page I want to stop the recording and just go over here we can now see the file has been uh, recording has been stopped I can double click on the file I just created and the quick time launches I can press play on that so this is a full 1080p 60 uh, 1080p 30 stream Again, it doesn't look uh, like it's smooth and uh, WebEx but I guarantee you on my desktop it is immaculate okay so I'll go back to the go back to the keynote like to go through a quick product run through oh one thing we didn't show why don't we do that actually show the product uh, what it looks like that might be useful go back to the live stream and so what we have here are the two devices monarch HDX and Frank is holding the monarch HD give you an idea of size I won't go through the product run through but at least you have an idea now of what um, of what we're talking about uh, size-wise very reasonable uh, both fit easily in a uh, rack mount in fact the Monarch HD three of those units can fit on our rack mount kit so two nice. Monarch HDX's can fit um, on that same rack mount kit all right back we go pretty good looking products if I do say so myself Dan. thank you thank you so from an IO perspective a Monarch HD had the uh, HDMI but with Monarch HDX we added uh, SDI on it these are selectable inputs they're not dual input you select which input you want to use on the audio side same thing you select the audio whether it be come from an embedded source as the or HDMI or an analog uh, source each input both HDMI and SDI has a frame sync Frank alluded to the importance of frame syncs rarely does a production go on with perfectly uh, smooth waveform a perfectly pristine signal um, generally speaking you'll get glitches like that and and you know uh, these glitches can really impact uh, encoders and a variety of other um, equipment quite negatively you know a monitor receives a glitch on a signal it just relocks as soon as it can all you really see is a glitch but an encoder unfortunately 
uh, can be impact the content that's being recorded in the stream could have much more uh, severe uh, consequences. And that's why in broadcast plants, they often hire a gentleman like this to condition and ensure the signal is always pristine going into some of the more sophisticated equipment. And this gentleman would be very pleased to hear that the Monarch HDX has frame syncs built into it. From a resolution standpoint, uh, we've got you covered from 1080p60. Uh, all the HD resolutions are covered on HDMI and on SDI. And then um, for the Monarch HDX, with SDI, we've added SD resolutions as well. Very important, particularly in some of the smaller stations, some of the applications, some of the installs still using a very good composite uh, uh, or SDSDI signals uh, that they don't want to, uh, uh, they don't want to change. They don't want to swap out those cameras. We're perfectly happy to use those signals as well. At the output side, all of them are live. All those outputs are live: HDMI, SDI, and analog audio, regardless of input. The input could come from HDMI with analog audio or embedded audio. SDI can come in with analog audio or embedded audio. And once again, as Frank mentioned. Um, we have this automatic bypass relay on the SDI signal. Um, this uh, ensures that should power go out on the device, the SDI signal is always present. In fact, at all times, the SDI being fed into the, mon into the Monarch HDX is being fed uh, at the output. Um, where you do connect a monitor, uh, some type of uh, projector at the output of the Monarch HDX, um, you would ensure that that never stops being fed. Uh, other type of equipment could be set down there, a secondary uh, encoder, by, uh, uh, secondary encoder, another redundancy, uh, all sorts of equipment can be set down there and you can ensure that um, it always gets fed a valid signal. For the physical uh, aspects of the product, what we have with the Monarch HDX is a selection switch up front, SDI or HDMI, you can uh, activate the encoders from the front encoder 1 and encoder 2. We have USB 1 and 2 and SD card. That's the media, the local media ports. On the back end is where you have your um, uh, power connection that, and that takes voltage levels from 9 ranging up to 24 volts. Uh, we have a your standard LAN connector, 1 giggy LAN port. And we have an RS-232 port um, on the back as well for remote control operations. HDMI inputs and outputs, your SDI inputs and outputs, as well as your audio inputs and outs. Finally, we have an auxiliary port that's currently being used for internal purposes. Uh, future uh, hardware or, or future features may come and make use of that, uh, but uh, it's important to note that there is a port there that's not currently used. Monarch HD had a, a number of interesting software features that uh, are to come on the Monarch HDX. I'd want to make sure I go through those for you. The first, and they all basically revolve around our development tools. And the Monarch HD dev tools include the following um, uh, features that will be found on the HDX. A simple HTTP control API to allow start, stop operations, get status of the device, using just simple web protocol. So you can write your own application to start and stop the unit. The Crestron, our Crestron module, something we make available uh, on our website for download, was written using this simple HTTP control API. So you don't have to use our Crestron control module. Uh, any third party um, controller could ultimately make use of that API uh, to control the Monarch. For our CDNs who wanted to have tighter integration with the Monarch tools, we created these auto configuration modes and that allows for um, automatic loading of uh, all the parameters necessary to set the Monarch up for streaming, recording and destinations. You can load up a file, an XML file and configure that. You can configure that. You can even have the Monarch call a particular web page. So call home to get the configurations on boot up. So these are some of the tools that we've uh, added to the Monarch HD that have been well received to allow tighter integration in particular environments. Monarch HD will get all these features shortly. And finally, the RS-232 control would mirror what the simple API, HTTP API would be able to offer from a start-stop um, point of view. However, those controls would come via the RS-232 port. So back to Frank, I'd like him to take it away for us. All right, thanks, Dan. So uh, for the takeaway, what is the um, what is the one thing 
that I want you to leave here today with. So what we want you to leave uh, today with is a clear understanding of how Matrox came to build the uh, HDX and how the three R's can work for you no matter what your workflow is. I mean, having reliability, knowing that your encoder can withstand any signal disruptions, redundancies, um, knowing your encoder has built-in backup subsystems, and robustness, knowing no matter what signal you use in your production, whether HDMI or SDI, your encoder can record and stream your content. So we believe these features and benefits are the ones that you're looking for in an encoder. And um, in fact, and uh, hopefully uh, it meets your requirements and all the workflows that you're looking to use it in. Thank you very much for participating.